from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's ahead. K-State's Dan O'Brien will be in to go over his budget projection for growing grain sorghum in Kansas this year, as he shared at K-State's series of grain sorghum schools this week. And Dan will talk about that wave of USDA grain-oriented reports coming out later this morning. Then K-State's A.J. Sharda talks about a new project here at the university which will develop an autonomous robotic system that will identify and treat insect infestations in crop fields on the go. This funded by a five-year USDA grant, the goal to come up with the ultimate in crop insect control efficiency. And further ahead on Kansas Agricultural Weather, K-State's Mary Knapp. Plus more on this. Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned to the Friday edition of Agriculture Today. As always, we appreciate you being along with us. For our grain market segment this week, we'll focus in large part on grain sorghum. As our guest has been on tour at K-State's Grain Sorghum Production Schools, Dan O'Brien is with us, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension, Mike's side this time around. Just want to ask you, Dan, about the conversation that you're having with producers at these grain sorghum schools and, and from the market standpoint, what's on their minds? Well, first of all, uh, the schools have been very well attended. Uh, I was at a meeting in Garden City on Tuesday, and I think 100 producers, 130 people total at that. Now, that, that was a sizable and, and successful meeting and lots of discussion uh, about all sorts of agronomic aspects of production. I tried to add in on cost of production and on market o- opportunities. Actually, they followed that meeting up with a uh, uh, RMA-sponsored risk management school. Uh, Art Barnby, our former colleague, uh, was in- involved in that, as well as a number of others who uh, – talked about and continue to talk about marketing opportunities and such. So that was good. And then uh, there was a meeting in Hayes, 70, 80 people, really, really good. Uh, also another good meeting, a meeting in Salina. For my part, I talked about, again, cost production, marketing opportunities, uh, cash prices in particular, and how basis levels right now are representing or not representing different aspects of, of success and usage. I think in the bigger picture, we came to a consensus that, yes, Grain sorghum is a feed grain, <laughs> and it's not produced in as large a scale as corn. It's 14.6 billion bushels. Uh, again, last year's production, somewhere in the range of 350 to 370 million bushels. We'll see what in the long run where that number finally lands out of the USD reports coming up. But in the areas where it's produced, it's very, very competitive. And, and, and again, in times when uh, exports are really strong, when we had the, the unique situation we've had in recent years uh, going into China, well, then uh, grain sorghum was able to literally separate itself, I think, marketing-wise, uh, with uh, some of the basis bids that it, it was receiving, you know, not necessarily akin to traditional proportional relationships with other feed grains. It stood out. Mm-hmm. Well, now that at least temporarily that situation slowed down. Yeah, that's, uh, that was short-lived, uh, unfortunately, for the right. grain sorghum grower. Yeah. Now it's a, it's a very competitive feed grains in these areas where it's available in quantity. And because of the transportation logistics, et cetera, uh, gosh, you look in the, in the Texas Panhandle area in the western two-thirds of Kansas uh, and other parts of Kansas as well, a lot of uh, grain sorghum available is very competitively used, and uh, we really sort of watch, in particular, uh, you know, the, the central part of the state and the eastern part of the state for times when basis bids really narrow up. It's kind of indicative of at least short-run uh, export demand, and we do actually see some of that right now, in the, at least off of USDA AMS reports, you see that we have a pretty strong bid in the Topeka area, it had been uh, about three over the March contract. And whereas in western Kansas, 
Western locations, we're looking at 50 to 70 under for basis bids. Central locations, we have a few of the major markets uh, in Salina, Hutchinson, where you're at 30 under, and some other areas where you know where you see some some decent strength. Again, Wellington, Hutchinson, Salina. So anyway, at the places where you'd expect to see some export demand, uh, we, we're starting to see a little bit of movement. Uh, of course, this has all been happening under the dark of night uh, in terms of not necessarily shipments, but the purchases. So maybe when finally we get the full bevy of, of USDA Foreign Ag Service export purchase reports out, and I think that's, well, it's coming up either 22nd or 28th here of February. Mm-hmm. When all that finally comes out, it'll be really interesting to see if we've had some forward purchases of grain sorghum, as, as well as for corn, soybeans, and wheat as well. Dan, since you did discuss the budgets for producing grain sorghum with producers directly, might tap into that for a moment here and the potential for profitability with grain sorghum here in 2019. What did you have to share there? Well, at the Hayes and Salina locations, we were focusing on north central Kansas numbers. The average yields for that period for non-irrigated grain sorghum was about 90, 92 bushels per acre. And the uh, total variable costs per bushel were about 273 in in 2017 a little over three dollars well about three dollars in 2012-13 so and in that 2012 through 16 time frame in, in 12 and 13 of course we had the, the drought in 12 coming out of the drought 13 so that really affected the price and the costs as they all worked up together so we, with the prices that we had Selling prices of three twenty or so for grain sorghum, at least in two thousand seventeen, a little bit higher. We averaged about three seventy eight, two thousand twelve through sixteen. You know, we we were covering variable costs with no problems. Just a matter of of uh, how much of the fixed cost in any uh, any of those years we're recovering. And really, and that's the issue for all of us when we have down. You know, for all these crops and we have challenged markets, we we're doing a good job of covering variable costs and pulling as much as we can forward then to cover the fixed. So uh, as it turns out, 2017, north central Kansas, uh, variable cost 273 for grain sorghum, fixed cost $1.26, which is very similar to every other crop that we've got. That's on a per bushel basis. Total cost 3.99. And uh, when you look at, at what our total costs were for the crops that grain sorghum is competing with, again, corn, soybeans, et cetera, in that area, uh, that's a pretty good showing. So if, if you took the 2017 budget, 90 bushel per acre, brought that into 2018 and left, left everything else the same and then added this 86 cents market facilitation payment uh, on an accrual basis for 2018, when likely to look like a pretty good year. Uh, but again, it's, uh, you've got that one specialized, intended to be a one-time payment that came in, and we'll, we'll see. Undoubtedly, though, you know, the, the large attendance at these grain sorghum schools probably has something to do with the anticipation of a pretty good year mm-hmm. uh, supported by that market facilitation payment. And to add to what you said a moment ago about the sorghum stock situation, as they likely could tighten, and again, that would be supportive of prices as we uh, move forward. I think for feed grains overall, we're in a situation where, where feed grains uh, – got up to about 2.3 billion bushels for corn stocks back in 2016, which affected the overall feed grain supply demand situation. Now, back in that same year, we were just heading into pretty strong um, exports for grain sorghum. So you had both these things going on at one time, but still in 2018, we're projected to have produced about, we may have mentioned this already, but about 350, 360 million bushels versus about 14.6, 14.5, something like that as a final number for corn. So grain sorghum is very competitive in the areas where we grow grain sorghum, but because of transportation logistics, we don't, we're not shipping a lot of grain sorghum to Indiana. <laughs> you know, we tend to use it in these areas at ethanol plants, livestock feeders, et cetera, and, and at times when the market dictates, we'll export it. Now, one thing I should say, the, here we talked about these uh, variable costs, 273 for uh, grain sorghum in 2017, probably something similar this, this coming year. Uh, bids at the ethanol plants for grain sorghum in Kansas are are at the range of where we're seeing corn bids at ethanol plants in other states. Uh, for instance, uh, for on Wednesday, the 6th of February, we had uh, uh, grain sorghum bids in Kansas at ethanol plants about 350 to 355. Of course, corn bids are about 380 to 405. 
But when you look at the the corn bids in uh, in Iowa and Kansas, the, the 350, 355 is right in there near the upper end of the range of corn bids at ethanol plants in those states. So for where we're at, ethanol usage of grain sorghum is a, is a very positive thing. And, and now, especially with fears, at least a temporary slowdown in, in the export side of things, grain sorghum is right in there mm-hmm. you know, competing for those uh, – for those feed and and ethanol processing uses. So you boil this all down and it comes out sounding as if grain sorghum will be a very reliable economic cropping option for 2019. I think uh, farmers are voting with their feet. You know, they're showing up at what we're offering uh, out of K-State, at uh, what other associational groups are offering and wanting to know about it. We'll see what how they vote with their planters, uh, yeah. li- literally. But when you look at those cost of production numbers, they compete pretty well with the other cropping options that are available. And they are a lower cost, you know, dollar per acre crop to put in than some other competitors. So to match what grain sorghum's costs are per acre, and if you have higher costs, you have to have higher yields. So that's really kind of the gradient of competition that we're looking at. So we'll, we'll see how all that goes as we head off into 2019. All right. And Dan, before you go, later on today, the USDA will open the floodgates with grain supply and demand data that's been backed up by the government shutdown and otherwise. And so the markets will obviously be attuned to what's coming out. Potentially a volatile day. Uh, A lot of pent up uh, information on wheat seedings, uh, quarterly stocks reports, uh, which will tell us on feed grains in particular what what our feed use has been. Wheat also Uh, will have a USDA's projection for ethanol usage. Most of the time we come into these reports, we can say, well, we have a pretty good idea what's going to happen export-wise. Well, on this one, we don't. Yeah. You know, our, We do a, somewhat, but there's more, more mystery than usual. So uh, it'll be really interesting to watch those numbers. Next week, we'll talk about how the markets react to this slew of information coming out within the hour, as a matter of fact. And Dan, we will talk then. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Along with us, Dan O'Brien, grain market economist with K-State Research and Extension and Agriculture Today, will return in a few moments on the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. We're back now on this Agriculture Today and into the area of advances in crop technology for you now. And Kansas State University, through its Agricultural Engineering Department primarily, is looking into the viability of using autonomous robots as a way of identifying and reacting to insect pest problems in standing crop fields. It's rather intriguing work, to say the least. And along with us now is the principal investigator in this project. He is A.J. Sharda, Precision Agricultural Engineer, K-State Research and Extension. And here we are once again, A.J., talking about something that on the surface really makes a splash. But uh, let's back up a little bit and identify what kind of system we're looking at here. So, Eric, we would like to limit pest population as much as possible. Um, We look for specific signs from entomologist standpoint, like what time and stage of insect infestation uh, is critical enough for us to go out and do some containment, whether it is integrated management or chemical application part of it. So how can we learn more about the level of pest incidence and severity on a more spatial scale so we can better understand what is the right time to control those insects and what is the right strategy to control those insects. 
because traditionally uh, how we do things or entomologists do things is we go out in the field and we look at specific areas, we scout for insects, we make a decision there on, and then we implement a, that decision on the entire field. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes that insect population, what we see in the area we scouted may not represent or truly represent the severity in the entire field. So if we can develop some intelligence and if we can use this intelligence to know the spatial severity and incidence of those insects, uh, we can better manage those those pests uh, and be more efficient. So it's about site-specific response to that insect pressure that might be out there. The USDA is funding this project through an over $800,000 grant to Kansas State University and using uh, ubiquitous collaborative robots, as it reads. This robotic technology is already out there, or are you going to be developing it? What? There are lots of autonomous robotic platforms are there, and there are a lot of application systems attached to it. But the concept of identifying the insects in season uh, using a platform and intelligence systems to go within the rows is the novel concept which we are trying to work on. So yes and no. So we'll be developing a lot of new concepts, strategies, and the whole systems uh, around those concepts to go out and function within the standing crop. So, yes, we will be working on a lot of new technologies and integration of those concepts to make that system work. These will be ground-based as opposed to from, say, up above on the boom of a spray unit, for instance, or even a drone? Yes. So, uh, since our goal is to understand all that in a standing crop, most of the times what we see is, and it is true for the nutrient as well, um, that uh, the nutrient deficiency or the, the pest infestation starts from the bottom of the crop and goes upward. So, that is the reason uh, we cannot use drones or something up in the air because we won't be able to see all the way at the bottom of the canopy. And most of the times, these insects are feeding on the back of the leaves, on the underside of the leaves. So we want some systems which can go within the crop rows and closely look the canopy, especially the underside of the canopy, uh, so we can start to make kind of a spatial map of insect severity and incidence. And once we know that, then we have we can develop systems to contain like a site specific systems to to apply product. And AJ, you say one of the the lead challenges here is programming these systems so that they can in fact distinguish insect presence from other things that might be going on within and underneath that canopy. Absolutely, it's uh, I think this is the biggest challenge in terms of the whole concept here. We have intentionally chosen aphids to be as a target pest to identify. We are going to develop a huge library of how these insects look like and because these insects, they kind of uh, feed in colonies and other insects have different behavioral uh, aspects. Um, but we would like to develop a lot of intelligence to rapidly identify uh, the presence of those aphids versus whether it is some other insect or some other things which may not be aphids on that. Another thing uh, is uh, ultimately the goal is that we should be able to move that platform at a good enough speed. We don't want to sit there plan by plan and identify this. That's not going to be a practical concept. In a full field scenario. Then, In a full right? field scenario. You know, there are thousands and thousands of plants. So we would like to develop something which can move at a decent speed because we also have to consider that we are trying to move a robotic platform in between two standing crop rows. So we cannot travel at 10 miles or 15 miles. But yes, if we can travel at a good enough speed and identify those things on the go, that's our goal. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the biggest challenge. And on top of that, you're hoping to outfit this system so not only will it identify the presence of those insects, but the severity or intensity of the infestation as well to factor in eventually then the proper insecticide response. Yes, exactly. So we we have Dr. Brian McCormick on the team. 
will be developing the decision support aspect of, of this technology. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Guanghui Wong from University of Kansas who will be developing the, the imaging uh, and the image analysis part. Dr. Daniel Flippo, the platform, and then our team and my team will be more in terms of systems integration, uh, liquid application system, data flow, data management, and all that stuff. Yes, so it, the system has to be compact. The system has to be lightweight. The system should be able to easily maneuver within the rows and yet robust enough to work in that diverse, dynamic environment of, you know, canopy architecture and soil and texture, soil residue and all that stuff. And then integrate it with your application technology, whatever it might be. Application, exactly, exactly. The goal is that once the system identifies, once the system sees the insect, uh, it should be able to clearly make, make a decision whether the incidence is critical enough. And if it is critical enough, it should just, you know, make that site-specific application of chemicals so that we do not apply a chemical on a whole field. And I also quickly want to point out that, you know, if we make decisions based on scouting, there may be some areas. So, say, for example, our scouting decision says that we do not need any spray right now. But there may be a lot of areas within the field which may still be even beyond that critical level of uh, insect infestation. And those are the areas where our yields are hurting. You know, we need that spray now. Mm -hmm. uh, and there may be some times when the scouting area says that I need spray, there may be a lot of areas uh, which do not need that application. So I think the bigger goal is to apply the product timely and contain the uh, the severity of those pests. Uh, one, that will definitely reduce a lot of chemical usage, but then it will also teach us a lot about how these insects, you know, develop and propagate and feed and, you know, all those things. So there's a, some excitement associated with the prospect of this technology. Absolutely. There are, there are lots of things which can branch out as individual entities. So it's a number of things which we are trying to do in this project are so much broad that they can be scaled and into numerous other applications because mm. the concept behind that is the same. I'm really excited that we're going to do a lot of things. It's going to be a baby steps. We're going to do something, you know, more static, more lab-based, then a little bit more mobile in a lab space, and then all the way mobile in the field, you know, doing some real things. So it's going to be an evolution of numerous concepts over the period of next four or five years. Uh, we'll see different levels of things being added to that platform all the way when the platform is fully functional with all the components which we envision that it should have. Yeah. Over the next five years or so, the duration of this $880,000 grant from the USDA to trigger this research, and it should be really, really fun to watch where this goes, AJ. So we'll have you back for an update as it goes along. Appreciate you letting us know about what you're undertaking here, and good luck with it. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. Once more, they are going to use that grant support to look into the the function of robots in field to identify insect pests within a given crop field, not only in terms of general presence, but intensity of that insect infestation, and therefore allow for a more precise application of an insecticide treatment to deal with that. A.J. Sharda is on the team of researchers at K-State, along with his colleagues at the Department of Entomology, Brian McCormick, and a fellow agricultural engineer, Dan Flippo. A.J. is a precision agricultural engineer here at Kansas State University. We'll be back with more on this Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Thank you. 
You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here, and now today's agricultural news headlines in brief for you, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, mild optimism over talks next week in China between top Chinese officials, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, was replaced by pessimism yesterday. The situation started when National Economic Council head Larry Kudlow told Fox Business Network that there was a pretty sizable difference to go before getting an agreement with China. Then CNBC reported that an unnamed senior administration official said that the media expected between President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping in late February might not take place. This official said things were fluid and that the talks next week could still take place. Later, President Trump, when asked by reporters at a White House event if he would still meet with Xi yet this month, he said no and said the meeting was unlikely. However, he did not rule out a meeting at a later day but said that nothing had been said. This following USDA Secretary Cindy Perdue last week at the Cattle Industry Conference saying that any agreement ultimately created between the two countries would have to go through normal congressional approval and would have to contain regulatory mechanisms to ensure that China adheres to intellectual property protections that have been one of the key sticking points for the United States in the ongoing debate. With an updated federal tax code in effect this year, what are some of the areas that you agricultural producers are consulting your tax advisors about, or should be? Here's a look from the USDA's Rod Bain. Where are some areas of the new federal income tax rules and regs that farmers and livestock producers should talk to their accountant or tax professional about while preparing their 2018 tax return? Guido Vanderhoven of North Carolina State University Extension notes. The big topic is what we refer to as Code Section 199A or the Qualified Business Income Deduction and does the operation, if it's a flow-through sole proprietor, sub-S corporation, partnership, or limited liability company, how does that affect and flow through to the individual tax return? He says that rule was designed to level the playing field among regular corporations that pay a flat income tax rate. And then the other one would be depreciation changes. We have had basically three significant changes there. First, new farm assets purchased in tax year 2018 will have a shorter depreciation rate of that asset from seven to five years, while farmers can use a larger declining balance in their new asset depreciation which essentially means that the taxpayer, the farmer, rancher, is going to be able to enjoy a more rapid write-off of that capital expenditure. Used assets still retain a seven-year depreciation rate, but maintain the 200% declining balance of new assets. And for the assets that are 15 and 20-year, such as land improvements and multipurpose ag structures of 20-year assets, we still have to use 150% declining balance. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And the EPA will get another hearing on a federal court's order last year to ban all chlorpyrifos insecticide registrations as the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit granted the agency a hearing in an order handed down this week in San Francisco. The EPA had asked for the hearing that will begin before all non-recused judges in the Ninth Circuit the week of March the 25th. On August 9th of last year, a three-judge panel on the court ordered the EPA to cancel all chlorpyrifos registrations in 60 days. The court ruling the agency was not justified in maintaining the insecticide's registration. Chlorpyrifos is the main ingredient in Dow AgriSciences' Lorsban insecticide, which targets pests such as soybean aphids, spider mites, and corn rootworm. In a proactive manner, the wheat industry is fighting back against ongoing misinformation about the healthfulness of wheat-based foods, and these efforts are meeting with success at several levels. Marsha Boswell has more on this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marsha? The Wheat Foods Council continued its battle on fad diets when it met in mid-January in New Orleans, Louisiana. Wheat has become an easy punching bag for fad diets and those who profit from them. But the Wheat Foods Council has adopted a strategic plan to help inform consumers about the merits of wheat foods by influencing the influencers and telling the story of wheat. 
The Wheat Foods Council's initiatives focus on building and maintaining relationships with dietitians and personal trainers, as well as improving the images of enriched wheat products and modern breeding and farming practices. According to Jordan Hildebrand, Kansas Wheat Program Assistant, research conducted by the Wheat Foods Council found that many personal trainers had little to no nutrition education, but were actively giving out dietary advice on a daily basis. The Wheat Foods Council has found that this is information those professionals desperately want, but we are among the first to actively reach out and provide it. This is an amazing opportunity for the wheat industry to help shape the discussion surrounding our product with these influencers. The Wheat Foods Council has made great strides in the personal trainer world over the last year. The council has been sending representatives, including world-class triathlete Michelle Tuttle, to professional personal trainer conferences for two years. The Wheat Foods Council presented at Idea World, the largest personal trainer event across the globe, with over 13,000 fitness professionals in attendance. A new venture for the Wheat Foods Council is the Center for Nutrition and Athletics, a website and app designed by Wheat Foods Council to clear misconceptions about nutrition's role in a healthy, active lifestyle. Experts have also given several record-breaking informative webinars on behalf of Wheat Foods Council to a personal training audience. The Wheat Foods Council also sponsored the Enrich Your Life 5K, hosted in Manhattan, Kansas, alongside the Little Apple Marathon. The Council is also maintaining contact with a number of registered dietitians they have reached through previous presence at trade shows and other events. The Colonel's Quarterly Magazine remains a popular enriching source for dietitians on the latest information about wheat in a healthy, balanced diet. The Wheat Foods Council has also started to sponsor courses at the Culinary Institute of America in Copia that draws chefs from major national and regional restaurant chains, including Wendy's, Sonic, McAllister's Deli, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and more, that are making menu decisions for millions of consumers. Kansas wheat producers have had an active role in the Wheat Foods Council since its formation in 1972. The Council is an industry-wide partnership dedicated to increasing wheat and other grains foods consumption through nutrition information, education, research, and promotional programs. The Council is supported voluntarily by wheat producers, millers, and related industries. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marsha. Is there an end to this unrelenting winter weather? We'll ask Mary Knapp about that next on Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. Agriculture Today is back now, and it's our time once again to talk Kansas agricultural weather with climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension, stopping over from the Weather Data Library here at the university, as always. And just to put it out there bluntly, winter, Mary, is reluctant to give up its grip. It's just relentless, it seems. Right, and we've actually seen some of the coldest weather that we've seen all season Temperatures were in the single digits and even a few sub-zero readings this morning as I walked over. Um, Fortunately, I was not out in western Kansas where those sub-zero readings are occurring. Um, It's also worth noting that we had some pretty strong wind chills, and those are continuing up in the north-central part of the state. Again, cold temperatures, strong winds, that gives us the wind chill that is a definite problem. You can monitor those wind chills if you like by checking out our mesonet at mesonet, M E S O N E T dot K S U dot E D U and just confirm your uh, feelings that yes, it is <laughs> cold out there. And we'll be contending with wind chills for a time, it sounds, as we get into the outlook. It was mostly a dry week around Kansas, but with notable exceptions and some weather oddities sprinkled in there. 
Right. If we look at the week which we use for evaluating our current drought situation, that week ends on Tuesday. Our winter weather system came in Tuesday night into Wednesday, so that will be featured in next week's. But looking at this last week, what we had was basically a dry week. Um, There was a little lingering moisture in northeast Kansas, but it was only two hundredths of an inch, 8% of what we would normally expect to see. It's also worth noting statewide, we were only a hundredth of an inch. Again, that's very dry, but at this time of the year, it is a dry period of the year. Our deficit for the week averaging across the state was only 19 hundredths of an inch not a really large amount to overcome. And in fact, we are still wetter than normal statewide for the year to date and, of course, for our growing season. Areas that are beginning to um, show some of that dryness are the northwest. They averaged only 62% of normal for the year to date. They are well above normal for the wheat season from September to February 5th. They're still at just under one and a half times their normal moisture for that period. So again, not really in any kind of extreme situation yet. We are seeing a little bit of abnormally dry conditions pushing in from eastern Colorado, but we'll see how that develops as we go into the rest of the month. It's still worth mentioning, though, that after Tuesday, the official recording period for this past week, few events occurred that will show up next week and some substantial moisture here and there. Right. And when we look at that, um, I look, the big storm was actually on the 7th. Mm-hmm. And what we got from that was statewide averaged a tenth of an inch, which is pretty good. But the big area for um, moisture accumulation was southeastern. Kansas. They had a lot of rain before the cold front pushed through. Um, McCune down in Crawford County reported 1.29 inches, which is is fairly nice. Mm. When you get to the backside of that front where the colder air dominated, that was mostly in northwest Kansas. St. Francis and Colby both reported two inches of snow out of the event, and that translated to five hundredths and eight hundredths of an inch of precip. So again, not a huge amounts, but welcome to kind of reduce that deficit that was was in play. Along with the snow and rain, we had ice, freezing mist, freezing fog, hail, grapple, thunder snow. It was a combination of all of those kinds of events. And again, indicative of some very strong dynamics aloft as that cold air was pushing the warm air out. Nice to hear that first rumble of thunder, (laughs) even if it came with snow, because you really um, start thinking of spring when we start getting our thunderstorms to remind us of that active spring season. Yeah, but we're by the sand of it quite a ways away from actual spring weather as you look at the forecast. The weekend is calling for basically more of the same that we've had the past several days. Well, it's going to be a little bit warmer over the weekend. It is interesting to note that it, when I was looking at Manhattan temperatures last weekend, we averaged 21 degrees warmer than normal with our yesterday's high temperature barely making it into the teens. We were more than 20 21 degrees cooler than normal. Mm. So you're going, all right, which of the week are we (laughs) going to see? This weekend, we're actually expecting temperatures to moderate a little bit. They may actually even edge above normal, but that's going to be very brief. There is a chance of uh, winter precipitation Saturday night, but the strongest chance is when the next system comes through on Monday night into Tuesday. And again, a mix of wintry precipitation. The liquid equivalent expected from that, according to the quantitative precip forecast, is not particularly high in most of the state. The highest amounts are hugging the Missouri border, and that goes from Nebraska to Oklahoma. But uh, there they may see as much as a quarter of an inch, a half an inch. Keep in mind, as witnessed with this last system, It doesn't take much of that freezing rain, freezing mist, sleet kind of mess to create a lot of travel havoc. So watch for that. It will become a particularly dangerous issue in the evening hours when visibility is reduced and it's harder to tell what you're approaching. 
take the proper precautions once again and looking ahead through next week, in fact, the remainder of February, you say, wetter than normal, but the cold will stick around. Right. The Climate Prediction Center's outlook for the 8 to 14, which carries us basically through almost the end of February, is for cooler and wetter than normal. Um, If we look a little bit further to our west, we can see a number of strong systems are approaching the west coast. Those will have to transition across the U.S. in some fashion. question will be, do they go to our north or do they go to our south? And how much of it overlaps Kansas? So last weekend, Puxatawney Phil, which you've expressed some doubt in the forecast by that groundhog, said spring would come early, but you put it in another context, Mary. Well, basically, I think Mother Nature wants to make sure we know what winter is before we get that early arrival of spring. All right. And thanks, as always, for coming over. Thanks, Eric. Mary Knapp, climatologist, K-State Research and Extension, is along with us each Friday right here. And thanks to you likewise for joining us, and do enjoy your weekend. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today, over this, the K-State Radio Network.